Before we get down to the nitty gritty, I want to thank my animators Adam Mitsuk or Kuzim and Tyler Addison for the animations in this video. If you like their work, consider following them on Twitter. Links in the description and comment section below. Now, on with the show. Something cute and tiny lurked off the coast of what would eventually become Japan. Far from the 300 foot, 90 meter Godzilla dimensions, this little sea serpent was equipped with giant, forward facing eyes and may have hunted prey in the dark of the sea bottom. Meet Phosphorosaurus, the deep sea mosasaur. Mosasaurs are pretty weird animals. They first appeared in the earliest late Cretaceous, with possible ancestors in the quite lizard-like Agealosaurs. They only had about 20 million years of evolution before they were wiped out with the rest of the saurian fauna. Their relatively low diversity is due to their short reign, but with that time, they became the dominant large predators of the world's oceans. Despite their short time, they did diverge into different groups that did things differently and slotted themselves into a cornucopia of different niches worldwide. One such group was the Halosaurinae, a group of small-bodied mosasaurs, a part of the lower classification Mosasauridae. Unlike their larger, more advanced Tylosaurine cousins, the Halosaurines are considered the least adapted for marine lifestyle with small, relatively inefficient flippers and small body size. Even with these setbacks, they were clearly quite successful, since they thrived right up until the KPG extinction event. In the science of classifying long dead organisms, each new genus you find and name should also belong to its own unique group or family. This is the classification ending in idae. Sometimes you can fit your new genus into a pre-existing family, but theoretically every single genus of extinct critter could fit in its own family and then those families would fit in a larger one. This is more so to do with the fact that a species level distinction is largely arbitrary when it comes to extinct organisms, since even something that seems closely related enough to be the same species as a previously discovered specimen might actually be from a few thousand years before or after it, making it more likely to be its own species or even genus if we're talking genetics and evolution. Back in the early days of paleontology, things were new and people were still trying to fit things where they ought to fit. As such, a lot of fossils that seemed to be closely related to other fossils were lumped together to represent slight variations or species level distinctions in one big genus, like we see today in all of the species belonging to the Panthera genus. The Halosaurines, as they are known today, were just one genus, Halosaurus. This was the genus to which anything even remotely similar to the first named genus and species, Halosaurus platyspondylus, was thrown into. Over the 152 years since that name was applied and those bones were described, Mosasaur researchers have finagled the Halosaurinae subfamily to be a bit more diverse than originally thought. It now contains four flippy floppy slippery genera of snake lizardfish. One of these is Phosphorosaurus. Louis Dolo was a Belgian paleontologist who was mostly a dinosaur scientist. However, he of course described a bunch more animals and posited a biological law known as Dolo's Law that evolution is not reversible. He was contemporaneous with Othenio Abel, one of the few ardent Nazi paleontologists you'll find, and together they formed the basis for the science of paleobiology or trying to apply biological principles to extinct organisms. This strapping fella described the remains of a halosaurine mosasaur that was found in the late Cretaceous aged phosphatic chalk deposits of the village of Sipli, which is located near the town of Mons in Belgium. The chalk was formed at the bottom of the ocean in this area over a period of millions of years. It's made from the decomposed remains of life broken down by microbial organisms that mixed with a large amount of the elements phosphorus and silicon. So, a normal chalk made of the skeletons of microorganisms and sludge from decomposed macroorganisms 
then became phosphatized from extra minerals and elements. This made this layer of rock very important for the people living here, as the phosphorus was processed into fertilizer for crops and the like. The bones that Dalo described from this area were pretty fragmentary, and were also quite similar to the Halosaurine Halosaurus platyspondylus, named by everyone's favorite Bone War scoundrel Othniel Charles Marsh in 1869. Dalo thought his bones, which consisted of a 42 centimeter fragmented skull, were just a tad too distinct from the American Halosaurus, plus it was found in Belgium, so he gave it a new name, Phosphorosaurus, or Libi. He basically just named it after the phosphorus resources of the chalk, so its name just means phosphorus lizard. I really hate it when people just name things at random. <laughs> Thanos. <laughs> Since it was essentially just a skull roof, the anatomy of the beast would remain a black void, like my soul, for more than a half century. In 1996, a paleontologist with a name horribly foreign to my tongue, Theogarten Lingam Soliar, took it upon himself to fully describe the same specimen Dolo did and add in a new fossil found in the Netherlands close to Maastricht, which is where the first mosasaurs were found and is the origin of the name Maastrichtian, which is applied to a slice of time in the late Cretaceous epoch. Lingham Soliar figured that the remains, which were still very fragmentary, were too ambiguous to remain its own genus, so he lumped it into Halisaurus as Halisaurus ortlibi. This wouldn't stand up to time, as most researchers never took up the claims, and it remained Phosphorosaurus even when a new specimen was discovered in Japan of all places. In the summer of 2009, paleontologist Dr. Tomohiro Nishimura of the Obetsu Museum collected a calcareous nodule along the Pankerosano Sawa, or Panketo Sawa Sawa Creek, located east of Obetsu, Hokkaido, Japan. A nodule is similar to a concretion, both of which can form as irregular round knots of rock around a nucleus or center that starts the snowball effect of accretion of rock around it. A concretion is usually formed this way. While a nodule tends to not have that much within it other than the original rock it was made from, they are also found lodged into a layer of rock that is usually of a different composition. In the case of the Japanese Phosphorosaurus, it was a rather complete skull, lodged inside a relatively large nodule of knotty calcareous limestone. Calcareous being the modifier that explains the rock is composed of a lot of calcium-rich or carbonate rock. This means the ball was super hard. Like my yeah. I mean, like the rocks I mean, like the mountains of the Wait, that wasn't dirty, why did it? Stop, stop. Up there. Why must I suffer? Speaking of suffering, let me lay out the exhaustive process the fossil and the poor underpaid or volunteer preparator went through to get the skull out of its tough exterior shell. So, in the case of a super hard rock encasing a fossil, you cannot just mechanically chip the rock away from the bone with a Dremel, pick, or air-powered mini jackhammer. Doing that would be more likely to harm the tool or the fossil so a more relaxed technique has to be taken. And by relaxed, I mean long and arduous, just like my <coughs> Damn it, not again. The specimen was subjected to an acid bath. The acid in question is more likely to melt off your skin in high enough percentage rather than make you trip balls as it's formic acid. Formic acid is produced by ants, if you didn't know, and is dangerous in high volume and high concentration. The more dangerous stuff used for fossils is hydrochloric or hydrofluoric acid. The acid used for the phosphorus source was diluted to 5%. Any of the bones that were sticking out of the rock were coated in paraloid, a type of thermoplastic resin, to protect them from the acid. The specimen was then placed in a vat of acid overnight so the acid could eat away the rock. The next day, the specimen was taken out of the acid, washed off, dried down, and placed in a water bath for 10 hours to get rid of the acid so it didn't harm the fossil. It was left to dry and then more paraloid resin was applied to the bones again, before it got dunked in the acid again. This process was repeated day in and day out for a grand total of two full ass years. This is due to the acid only removing about a millimeter of rock each acid water acid cycle. With my low level undiagnosed ADHD, I would probably pull my hair out with such a long task. 
since the specimen was a relatively complete skull. The bones that emerged from the nodule were a jumble of different skull parts. It had to be put back together. The whole specimen was most of the skull and a handful of neck vertebrae. Instead of gluing all those pieces back together, they made molds of each piece and cast them in plastic. Then they glued all the cast pieces together to get a full picture of the specimen. This was so they didn't harm any of the original fossil material. When put together, the skull was only missing the front part of the snout, and was astonishingly uncrushed. It's nearly perfectly preserved in three dimensions. With all that work, and all this new data, the researchers were able to identify that this new specimen was not only Phosphorosaurus, but differed just enough from the first Phosphorosaurus to justify a new species. Phosphorosaurus ponpetelagens with Ponpet meaning creek in the local Hokkaido language of Ainu, and Elegans meaning elegant. That makes the new guy Elegant Phosphorus Creek Reptile, which is decidedly more interesting. Now we can get to the good stuff. Phosphorosaurus now represents the only known, possibly deep sea mosasaur yet found. The researchers who described the new remains, including Takuya Konishi, Michael W. Caldwell, Tomohiro Nishimura, Kazuhiko Sakurai and Kyo Tanui found that Phosphorosaurus had binocular vision. The eye sockets face more forward than in any living snake or lizard, two groups of reptiles mosasaurs are most related to, as well as any other known mosasaur. They found that its field of view overlaps with a conservative angle of overlap of 35 degrees. Authors made sure to look at all of the skull elements to see if there was anything that would have obstructed the critter's field of view, but there's nothing. A narrow, depressed snout providing an unobstructed field of view that overlapped to create depth perception in binocular vision correlates pretty strongly with nocturnality in modern snakes that have similar levels of vision. This sort of vision would have doubled Phosphorosaurus's photoreceptors for light detection. That means it was probably quite sensitive to light. A critter that is sensitive to light has good depth perception and has enormous eye sockets for big ass eyes results in a predator that probably spent most of its time in the deep dark depths of the ocean hunting for bioluminescent prey items like lanternfish and squid relatives found in the same layer of rock as our little mosasaur friend. Speaking of little, the skull was about 20 inches, 50 centimeters long. There's probably some formula out there somewhere that can correlate skull or snout length to body length, but since this critter's skull was small compared to other larger mosasaurs, its body was probably equally small. Let's go with about 3 meters 10-ish feet because that's what I keep seeing through my research. Obviously that's super tentative, but aligns with what is known about the Halosaurines. Something so small would be a good candidate for a special kind of deep sea niche. Obviously such a lifestyle is a bit of a stretch when you're going off the skull alone, but the data that was preserved with the skull does suggest something at least along the lines of a nocturnal predator hunting after glowy things. Since Phosphorosaurus is a halosaurine, it probably also retained the small inefficient flippers and body size, making it even more likely to be the speculated deep sea glowfish hunter. If it was something approaching this niche, it probably would have had strong countershading colors of a dark top and light bottom, so its prey couldn't tell its belly apart from the surface of the water or its back from the depths. Here I've had 3D modeler Adam Midzuk and animator Tyler Addison recreate the Phosphorosaurus with a super dark blue top and grayish cream belly, with some contrasting gray dorsal stripes. Going off of its eyes alone, this was probably the cutest mosasaur ever and I wish I could see it in an aquarium. That's about all there is to Phosphorosaurus at the moment. Hope you've enjoyed this first entry of Mosasaur Week. Hopefully this is coming out with enough time for me to make another video. If it isn't, hope you've been enjoying Mosasaur Week. If it's not, hope you are enjoying it and that you continue to post more cool stuff about these sea lizards using the hashtags hashtag Mosasaur Week, hashtag Mosasaur March, and hashtag Mosasaur Madness to get everyone to see your work. Gavialli Minus is definitely a candidate for the next video, so stay tuned.
Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.